An F-16 from Eglin Air Force Base jettisoned its fuel tank into a neighborhood near the base. Let's talk about some possible reasons why that could have happened. All right, so Midbay News is reporting that only by the grace of God, fuel pod lands in Niceville and causes no injuries or damage. There's been some pictures, probably unauthorized, posted on certain Facebook groups. I think it was an F-16 D model two-seater, but I'm not going to share those. I'm just going to share what the article has, and we'll talk about some possible reasons why that might happen. But this was on Tuesday, January 7th on uh, Monette Street or Monet, Niceville, Florida, near an elementary school. The cause is under investigation. It says a fuel pod from a military aircraft dropped from the sky and miraculously missed people, homes, and cars. The city manager said only by the grace of God it landed between two houses. It occurred at a home on Monette Street about 600 meters from Edge Elementary School, left the shredded wreckage of the fuel pod on the ground feet from the home. No one was hurt. They're investigating uh, they smelled fuel, and they don't know why it happened. The incident didn't make him rethink living near the base. Uh, it's a jet noise designated APZ-2 by the Air Force on their map. They fly over every day. That's a picture of it. You can see the end caps missing because it hit and probably exploded. Not exploded, but came apart. And then fuel, whatever fuel was in there, obviously, no longer is in there. So why did this happen? The Air Force is going to investigate. It's not considered a Class A mishap, which is what will get an AIB report. So we'll never actually get an AIB. And thankfully, right, the F-16 landed successfully at Eglin Air Force Base safely. No loss of life, no injuries, nothing like that. Eglin is the home of the Test and Evaluation Squadron. And we've talked about this previously, about them testing the AI F-16, but it's never AI in the pattern. There's always a pilot flying. So whatever happened here was not like an AI F-16 punching off his tanks and going self-aware. This was a piloted aircraft. Probably, if it's the test guys, usually it's pilot with an engineer in the back and they're getting test data. It's not all the... AI F-16 stuff. They do a bunch of other test stuff too. So why might you jettison a fuel tank? So the F-16, single engine. And when you talk about an engine malfunction of any kind, your first action is to get rid of weight and drag. And that usually ends stores jettison. Uh, D model in an air-to-air -air configuration typically has that 300-gallon fuel tank on the center line. So it's been a while since I've done any F-16 stuff. I'm not going to try to remember the critical action procedures because it's been that long. So I'm going to read directly from them. If there's an afterburner malfunction on takeoff, takeoff continued. You didn't abort the takeoff. You continue flying. The memory item. So the things you have to do from memory, you don't reference a checklist. You just do it. Uh, throttle mill. So you take the throttle, put mill power out of afterburner, stores jettison. What does that do? Remove some of the weight, remove some of the drag. More severe than that, engine failure on takeoff, takeoff continued, you didn't abort. Zoom, so you trade the airspeed for altitude, stores jettison, so jettison the tank, and eject. However, comma, doesn't apply here because they landed. Low thrust on takeoff or at low altitude. If you get some situation where bird strike, something happens to that engine, you have a low thrust situation, throttle afterburner, stores jettison if required. So if you've got that tank, you're punching it off and trying to get yourself to a one-to-one -one glide ratio, you know, 10 miles, 10,000 feet, five miles, 5,000 feet, et cetera. After that, if thrust is still insufficient or AB does not light, engine control switch, sec, then pry. So that's a engine control switch over on the left. Engine fire on takeoff, takeoff continued, climb, stores jettison if required. So that is on takeoff, right? Airport environment. Now, in flight, critical action procedures, engine failure, air start. This is for the GE engine, which I think it might be. I don't know. Zoom, 
Stores jettison, if required. I.e., if you have stores on the aircraft, not if you think you need to or not. It's if you have stores on the aircraft, punch them off. Sometimes stores were uh, not carted, so you couldn't punch it off. We had certain pods we would carry that they had no way to jettison them, so you'd be stuck with them. So if you just had that left, that's all you had. Targeting pod, for example, is never carted. can't be carted, so you can't punch off a targeting pod. Engine control switch, sec, then pry, airspeed as required, JFS, jet fuel starter, uh, start to below 20,000 feet. So that is uh, pretty much it. Anytime you're in the low altitude environment and something is happening, your first action is more than likely, especially if it's the engine, is going to be get rid if it's a critical, like engine's not producing the power that I think it has or doesn't produce any power or there's a fire or something that I think I'm going to have to do, an actual flame out landing, not a simulated, but an actual flame out landing. I'm punching off that uh, fuel tank or two fuel tanks. It's either a 300 gallon in the center or two 370 gallons on the wings. There are some other in-flight emergencies that might drive this, but it's typically anytime you need to get drag and weight off the aircraft and in a hurry. You don't have time to burn down fuel or anything like that. The F-16, unlike the F-18, no fuel jettison, so you can't dump fuel but you can burn fuel by your left hand, afterburner board, stuff like that. But that's only if you have time. If you're in a no kidding critical situation, you're gonna punch off that tank. When they showed the landing, they showed it being taxi uh, towed back, which could mean it was not under any kind of power. Remember also, the F-16 has an emergency power unit that if the engine fails is enough to power the flight controls so it's powered by hydrazine which is a very toxic subject substance and can cause cancer and it needs special hazmat crews once it's activated to make sure that you know the surrounding area is safe but i don't know if that happened here all i know is they punched off the tank into uh, unfortunately a neighborhood and had to get towed back that's the the two things i've seen in pictures now, you may ask, and a lot of people will, well, what about the neighborhood? Are you thinking about that? Well, yeah, you are, but you have to consider the alternative, right? If the difference between crashing an F-16 into a neighborhood versus a 300-gallon fuel tank into a neighborhood is all you have to consider, you're going to take the 300-gallon fuel tank. If you can get that aircraft safely back on the ground, it's better to risk that three. I mean, yes, that's very unfortunate. You don't want that to happen, but there's no control. When you punch off that tank, you don't really, there's no targeting information. There's nothing that tells you where that tank is going to go. You're just kind of hoping it works. And that's unfortunate. If it had hit the elementary school, we'd be talking about something very tragic right now. And we're very fortunate that it didn't happen. But that's the risk with having anything around a fighter base. And Eglin Air Force Base started out with not all this encroachment around it, and now we've got civilization around it, and this is kind of the consequence, right? Because we still have to do operations, and we don't want to lose an aircraft and crew just because we didn't want to punch off that tank. Because you have to punch off that tank at that moment because it, it, is, it could be a matter of seconds as the difference between I can make it back to the field or I don't have enough and I'm going to eject. And this, then this aircraft, then the whole aircraft is a projectile into a neighborhood. So it just depends. Now, other scenarios where you're going to punch off the drop tanks, tactically speaking, once they're dry in combat, or if you're trying to do something where you need to go fast or get high, yeah, you're going to punch off those tanks. They're drop tanks. But in peacetime training around the flagpole, it's usually for some kind of emergency. And in this case, uh, it looks like it was because, they, you know, they're getting towed back, which means they weren't under their own power necessarily. Is this something that happens regularly? No. And is it something the public should be worried about? No. It is a risk with being around a fighter base, any fighter with drop tanks or stores. That's why we'd fly certain routing around cities when we had live bombs, because if you had to jettison them, even though they would come off safe, you didn't want to jettison live bombs in certain areas. So you always had special routing to make sure you weren't flying over certain areas in the event of an emergency. 
obviously F-16, single engine, it's more of a threat than a, a twin engine fighter. However, even a twin engine, sometimes you're going to have to punch off those tanks because that one engine may not be enough with all that drag and all that weight to get you home safely. So that's why we have it. It's safety for the aircraft and safety for the pilots. We're very fortunate that it did not create a bigger mishap. And sometimes it's just, you know, it's better to be lucky than good because this is pure luck of where it ended up. So let me know in the comments what you think. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.